Well, I don't see Daniel yet. He's, uh, you know, he's three and a half minutes late. So uh, he asked if I could uh, go ahead and, you know, break down the different parts of the message this morning. And I said no. So, uh, um, but it was very interesting to, uh, to hear that. And here he comes right now. So uh, that's great. You're just in time, Daniel. I was just telling them that you had asked me to con- continue on and break down what you had laid out so well this morning, and I had graciously said no. So, uh, yep. All right. So you've already prayed. All right. Good. So Jeremy's not here, and he told me Friday that I should do Q&A with you. (laughs) Uh, I'm sure I can find something else to talk about if you don't have any questions. But we have covered a lot of uh, maybe unfamiliar territory in the last couple of weeks, so I thought it would be a helpful, helpful time to maybe answer some questions. Yes, Chris. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Mike's. <laughs> uh, so on like Psalm 4, yeah. you're, you're putting the to the choir master with the stringed instruments with Psalm 3, but then why did you stop and leave a Psalm of David to Psalm 4? Okay, so the actual Psalm 4, I believe, begins with a Psalm of David. Everything before that belongs with Psalm 3. Why do you cut it there? Why do I cut it there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Good question. Yes. Why do I cut it there? How do we know? So the, the literal, in this instance, the literal words of Habakkuk to the choir master with or on uh, my stringed instruments is exactly what is here. So where that ends, we end. There are some instances where it's not so easy to figure out where it ends. And what I'm suggesting is that is a matter of interpretation that we have to figure out in each instance. So in this instance, to the choir master, that's always at the end. There's no exceptions to that that I'm aware of. With stringed instruments, usually follows the choir master, and it's then part of the colophon. So it would be to the choir master, actually it's just fine here, to the choir master, uh, colon, with stringed instruments. That's the part that's to the choir master. And then the Psalm of David is the title, and that's where it begins. Ms. Morla David, which is very common throughout the Psalms, it's all over the place, a Psalm of David, a Psalm of David. That's how it starts. Now that's parallel to Habakkuk. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet. That's how he starts. A prayer of Habakkuk. This is a psalm of David. And so that's where I start. Yeah. Okay. I'm still confused because when you went to 40, Psalm 46. Oh, yeah. Psalm 46 is actually tricky. Okay. So. Of course, that, I didn't go into that during the psalm or the message. Yeah. So let's look at Psalm 46. To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamot. So this is far trickier than you would think. Because we have to the choir master, and then we have of the sons of Korah. So is it, is it, a, uh, is it a, a title as at the top, or is it at the bottom? Where do you put of the sons of Korah? Well, most of the sons of Korah are author. They're, they're, who's the author? And they belong at the beginning, right? I mean, that's where that's where you'd think it's. If it's a psalm of David, this is a psalm of the sons of Korah, or a masquil of the sons of Korah, or a uh, all a, a, a song of the sons of Korah. Is it at the beginning or the end? Well, it looks like. In Psalm 46, they, the sons of Korah are listed in the colophon. I think to the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamot, is that's the colophon. 
then the title of 46 is only a song. And that's where I would put the division. Now, the reason for that is there are multiple Sons of Korah songs where the Sons of Korah are in the colophon and not in the title. And we know that. uh, Let me see if I can show you the clearest example where there's no way around it. Um, Let's see. 46. uh, Let me see. Give me one minute. Okay, so we have in 45, I take the sons of Korah also in the colophon. Uh, So it's for the choir director by the sons of Korah in the Alamot style. That's 45's colophon or 46 in in your psalm. And then also in... I want to say it's 80. I'm sorry, I got to find it. I don't remember it off the top of my head. 80, go to 87. This is the one. This is the kicker. This is the most complicated title in the whole Psalter. So we have Psalm 87. And un- unfortunately, the English word order doesn't match the Hebrew order. So, but here's the English. A psalm of the sons of Korah, a song. That looks innocent enough. It's not. Very complicated. So, a psalm is not actually the first word in the Hebrew. Sons of Korah, of the sons of Korah, is the first word or the first phrase. The second phrase is a psalm. The third phrase is a song. Now look at 88. A song, a psalm of the sons of Korah to the choir master, according to Mahalath Leonoth, a maskeel of Heman the Ezraite. Oh my goodness. That is a bulky title. What is going on? There's like this, this complicated, there's no easy way around this, whether or not you accept my proposal or not. There's no easy way around dealing with 88. You have a song, a psalm. It's of the sons of Korah. It's also a maskeel, and it's also of Heman the Ezraite. You have either multiple authors, like two different people said to be the author, And you have multiple designations, a song, a psalm, a maskeel, three different, so totally unique. There aren't any other psalms where there's so many different descriptions. So here's my explanation of 87. I take, I take the bulk of the title in 88 uh, to be the colophon of 87. Here's, here's how it actually makes sense. Uh, but it is a little complicated. This is why I did not talk about this in the message. I think many people would have, I would have lost many people. I may still lose many people. Okay, so Psalm 87. First part, A, is sons of Korah. So sons of Korah. Second part is a psalm. Third part is a song. Those are the three parts. Then in reverse order, 88 occurs. A psalm, sons of Korah, a song, and then 88 says, a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. So it's actually, uh, the second part is psalm, and then the third part is uh, the sons of Korah. Now, does that sound familiar to anyone? Does that like jump out at anyone as, wait, I've seen something like that before. What are you thinking of? Yeah, what? Uh, That's the inclusio. Similar, similar. This is would be called a a chiasm. A chiasm or a mirror or a reflection. 
So if you have A, B, C, then you step backwards. C, B, A. A, B, C, C, B, A. Now that pattern, you go, it's like an inverted, an inverted pattern. In our modern day, in English, we're not, we don't do that at all virtually. I mean, it's very unusual. We want A, B, C, A, B, C. That's what we all want all the time. A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. We always do that. And that was not the case in ancient times, either in the Hebrew or in the Greek. It's very common to find the pattern A, B, C, and then C, B, A. I think that's what we see here. And so the way it would read at the beginning, at the top of 87, by the sons of Korah, a psalm, a song, and then at the bottom, a song, a psalm, by the sons of Korah. Now, that fits and makes sense. That doesn't prove anything, but it does make sense. And then the end of it is for the choir director in the Mahalath Leonoth style. And that would be the full colophon. So that's what I would propose we would do there. Now, because of that, there's no way around the fact that the sons of Korah are going to have to be uh, put in a colophon. If not here, it will have to come later on. And so getting back to your original question, the, in, in Psalm 46, the sons of Korah sometimes are mentioned in the colophon. And so in 46, I think there's reason for us to think, okay, yeah, this is the sons of Korah belongs in the colophon. So in Psalm 46, or really it's 45's colophon, it would be for the choir director by the sons of Korah in the Alamos style. And that would be the end of the colophon. What's, what's the difference between a song and a psalm? Uh, a song, it has to be sung. So a song is always sung. A psalm may not necessarily be a song. <clears throat> Most songs are psalms. And it's not always strict. But when it's mentioned specifically, it's this is to be sung. We need to sing this. It's not, maybe to distinguish it, it's not just musical. It is a song. So you might have a psalm that's musical, but not necessarily, you're not singing it necessarily. Maybe you don't have to match a melody to it, but it's still musical. And when it's a song, it's very clearly to be sung. Yeah. I've got the mic. That's right. um, so is it, would it be helpful if we were looking at the original language rather than the English translations? That... Well, the good news is half of their translation is the original language. They don't translate it they don't, because they're, they're so confused about what it means. And so all they do is they transliterate it. Yes, it would help, but not nearly as much as you'd think. What would be most helpful is if we took out the headings and the chapter divisions. If we, if we could just remove those or put them off to the side, then it would be, oh, I see what's happening. Um, and that's, I'm not proposing that we do that because it would create such confusion. I mean, think about it. If I told you to, even now, like if you go, if I tell you, oh, this is in such and such a verse, and then you go back to the Hebrew, it's not that verse because the Hebrew's off by a verse. Whenever there's a title, the Hebrew puts it as verse one, in the, unless it's a really, really short title. The Hebrew moves to verse two for the start. Well, that's verse one in the English. So they're all off by one. And it's just like, which verse? I said it was this verse. You go and look it up and it's like, it's not in this verse. Oh, it's the one after. It's the one before. Um, so I think that would probably be the most helpful is if we could, while we're lo- making the decision, ignore the numbers and look at the, the text. Sometimes the word order changes. It has to in translation. Sometimes you just have to change the word order in a translation. But where we do, um, it can sometimes be a little confusing, which, which, which came first. Because I'll propose on a couple of occasions, it looks like you've got A, B, and C. And I'm saying B belongs with the one before it, but A and C go together. And the reason is that's not how it is in the Hebrew. These would be switched in the Hebrew, and I'm saying this goes with the one before it. So that's the only time where it would be really, really helpful. Okay. Yes. I have a mic. Okay. You have a mic. Um, I guess it, to me, and I'm thinking other people, it all boils down to 
where is God in all this? Has he protected his word or did he like bring it to a certain point and then said, here, you guys take it? Where's the inspiration and protection of the original scripture inspired yeah. by him? Yeah, God always takes care of his word. Um, he does not always take care of his word in the way that we would take care of our word if we were God. Right? I mean, because that's the obvious question is, hey, if I were God, I wouldn't have done it that way. Um, but he, he does. He always takes care of his word. There are, though, let me, uh, just a real simple <clears throat> um, illustration. What if we don't understand, what if we don't have a translation of a word? Uh, for example, uh, for many, many centuries, this phrase in the Lord's Prayer our Father, which art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread was an unknown word. It was the only place in the Bible that we saw it. And in no other literature did we see this phrase, daily bread. <clears throat> so for a long time, people thought, well, we don't really know what it means. It could mean this. It could mean that. It could mean this. And there is this um, level of, did God preserve his word? And if he did... Why don't we know the exact meaning of this word? Does God promise to give us the exact meaning of all of his words? I don't think he does. And so for a long time, it was unknown. Uh, then they found it in some, um, uh, like, scripts. Um, what do you say? Like, receipts, almost, for soldiers. And it was what they were given for their daily ration. <laughs> well, no wonder we didn't find it. We're not a lot of people studying soldier receipts. It's like, throw that stuff away. They don't matter. Well, we uncovered some and that's where they were. It was the daily bread was like a ration. It's what you needed for that day. It was what you were given, assigned for that day. Now that means something like, give us, our, give us this day our daily bread. Give us our ration for the day. We know that we, you know what we need and you're going to give us just enough. Okay. All of that to say, God promises to preserve his word, but there are times in which he allows his word to be obscured. And I think that's what we're dealing with here is there's an obscuring of God's word that has gone on for some time. Why he allowed it? I don't have the answer to that. I can kind of explain how it happened, but I don't think I can explain why he allowed it to happen. And that's not just true of this. It's true of many other places where the meaning is obscured. Um, and we don't know exactly why it means that or why it says that or, or what it means. That's fine. His word was still kept. Our understanding of his word is not guaranteed. Does that make sense? So we may know the words of God, but not know its meaning. And that's what we're dealing with here. Okay, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I think Amy was first, and, but then Kathy needs a mic. So just based on what you were proposing and looking at versus... What chapter? I mean, sorry, looking at chapter 46, 45 and 46. So yep. then 46 would not have a title. 46 has a title. It's a song. Okay. And then 86 would not... Uh, 86 uh, is a prayer of David. Wait, one of them wouldn't have a colophon or whatever you call it. 86 does not have a colophon. Oh, yeah, because you kept the, the title with 86. Yeah. Okay, so no there's colophon. Just, and then 88 is a masquil of Heman the Ezraite. That's, that's the, the title. title and okay. then it has no colophon. Okay. Now, look, I, all that confusing stuff I told you, look at this 88. A masquil of Heman the Ezraite. 89, a masquil by Ethan the Ezraite. 90, a prayer by Moses, the man of God. That seems like a pattern to me. That fits the pattern. That puts all of the uniqueness in 87. And that's part of why I conclude that makes more sense to me. 87 is just its own unique deal. I, I, we don't have any other title like that. And it's going to be that way either way, either in 87 or 88, depending on how you take it. But Okay, I think it was Kathy. Um, this is your re regarding your response to Lee's question. Oh, yeah. Um, so just to make sure I'm understanding you correctly, the text of the psalm God has kept intact yep. 
And it's what you're talking about as obscure are the introductions and the caliphones or that kind of thing. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, not the call. The caliphones, I would say, are part of the text. The they are. I mean, what we're talking about is we have this text. Where do we put a paragraph marker? Mm-hmm. That's what we're talking about. So and that's I, what's obscured. Yes. Okay. What's obscured the meaning is we put the paragraph markers in the wrong place. Totally. I mean, it's an innocent mistake, and I'm not saying you've got to be dumb to do that. It's just, but look, it's led to a lot of confusion. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what I'm saying. Okay. So, so the actual text, and of course we hear about this in other books of the Bible too, yes. like that chapter shouldn't have been marked there. But the actual text of God's word, yep. he has protected Amen. and kept intact. Yes. Okay. All, all, right. all of Thanks. God's words are kept. And think about it like this. When God delivered this word, he did not put in numbers. Uh, well, that's not entirely true. If you read the book of numbers, he did. The, he didn't put in chapter and verse numbers. He didn't do that. Now, I think chapter and verse numbers are really helpful for me. I also think English is really helpful for me. He didn't put it in English when he said it. So we're trying to help God's people understand his word. And sometimes we make mistakes when we do that. Here's one of them. And we're trying to kind of maybe fix that mistake and bring back some understanding. Okay. I don't remember who was next. Oh, oh, Mike, did you have one? The mic. Oh, did you already lose the mic? Oh. I have the mic. So you'll we'll have to come back. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, Psalm 9 in my version says, to the tune of the death of the sun. So it's giving a name. Give me, give me one second. Okay. So Psalm 9. Psalm 9, the title. And what translation are you reading? Well, this one, I have many, but this one is NIV. NIV? Yes. I... <clears throat> this is one area where I am not happy with the NIV okay. at all. Not this verse. <laughs> but the reason is they do not take them seriously at all. Like say law, find it. Find it. The, they, they removed them from some of their translations. So they just, yeah, we don't really know what this means. So we'll leave it out. So they took it out. Okay. Like what? Uh, I'm calling foul there. You can't remove God's words <laughs> right. just because you don't know what they mean. We can admit that we're confused. We have no idea what it means, but don't take it out. Anyway, so uh, sorry. <laughs> that, that really has nothing to do with what you're asking me. <laughs> Psalm 8, according to uh, Psalm nine. Bin, Psalm 9. Psalm, it's, it's the colophon oh, of Psalm okay. 8, though, right? Okay, right. So, yes, yeah, Psalm 9's title part of it belongs with Psalm 8. Okay. This, so, is that what you're talking about? Well, because when you were talking, you it, it, you were kind of explaining like what, what that could have meant. And I was just seeing that mine says to the tune of, so it's giving the song that they want this music to be played to. Yes. I think that's, that's likely... Uh, that's a fine interpretation to say that according to Mutla bin or according to the death of a son, it's some sort of a tune. The tune is that what they said? The tune of yes, to the to the tune of the death of the son. Yes, and that's classic NIV. I think that's a fine explanation. But if you translate it that way, there's no other possibility. Well, the text leaves open a couple possibilities that you don't see if you translate it that way. So I think that's a fine translation. I think that makes a lot of sense. I might even agree with them. Uh, But according to Mutla bin, it could mean other things as well. Um, The the, uh, the explanation that Thurtle... uh, I didn't even mention Thurtle, did I? Mm. Have you heard Thurtle? James Thurtle was the man who initially published this proposal that the Psalms have been misdivided based on Habakkuk chapter three. So James Thurtle, uh, and he did this in like 1905, 1905. Anyone alive back then? (laughs) I don't think so. Uh, And it was basically, it fell by the wayside and got ignored um, for, for many decades. 
So his proposal is this would be to the, to the death of a champion and that, that it had some connection to Goliath. So that's a possibility. I think the NIV's translations, I prefer the NIV's explanation of it. Um, but that's, th- these are all matters of interpretation. So it's, it's, it's according to the death of something, how, where do we go from there? Is it a tune? Is it a reference to a historical event? And we've got to decide that on our own. It's not like a right and wrong thing. Okay, and then in Psalm 45... When you were talking about the lilies. Yes. Um, So then in here, this title says, for the pretty much everything you said, to the tune of lilies of the sons of Korah, a masco, but then it says a wedding song. Okay, yeah, and that's their interpretation of a love song. A love song or a song of a wedding. That's how they're understanding that what it, what does it mean to have a love song well it's a wedding song a song of love how about that what is a song of love well it could be a wedding song and that's their interpretation that's why they translate it that way because in the notes it says a song in praise of the king on his wedding day that and that's their best guess as to what's going on here and that all comes from this text of psalm 45 They read Psalm 45 and they're like, whoa, why are they talking about this handsome guy? Oh, maybe it's a song about the king on his wedding day. So they're all putting that together based on the text. That's good work. I appreciate that kind of work because they're starting from the text and explaining it from the text rather than going outside the text and bringing that understanding to it. Who's who's next? Greg. I don't mean this to sound snarky. You know what? I'm just going to stop right there (laughs) and challenge that. (laughs) Okay. You seem very confident on how you're breaking down the caliphons and the titles. Um, Why didn't the ESV or the NIV or or New American Standard... Uh, see that same obvious breakdown? Yeah. Good question. So I think the, the way I'm going to answer that is by asking them the question you just asked me. Dear ESV, why are you so confident in your divisions of the psalm titles? And their answer? That's how they did it before us. And you ask them, that's how they did it before us. We're watching Fiddler on the Roof. The answer? Tradition. That's no, that was not dancing, was it? <laughs> Tradition, that this is the way we've always done it. And so, and I appreciate that in text translation. It is smart. You need a reason to deviate from what has come before you, or you're going to be off a slippery slope really quickly. So I appreciate that, but that is such an easy explanation that I then can come in and say, okay, can we reconsider this? And do we have a reason to? So I think we have a good reason to. Habakkuk chapter 3 gives us warrant to say, hey, where are all the colophons in the Psalms? You guys divided the Psalms without one colophon, not one. That, that's not true. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. Psalm 72, that's one colophon in the whole, in the whole Psalter. So there's one. Where are all the other ones and why what we find in the colophon of Habakkuk 3, why do we find that in the titles of your divisions? So that's, that's my basic answer. Well, I think we're on equal footing in terms of interpretation. We're both interpreting it. I'm saying I think this division helps us understand the words better than your division has for 2,000 years. More than 2,000 years, because this started with the Septuagint, when the Greek translators of the Hebrew, when they did it in roughly 2,300 uh, BC, when they did it, they had no clue what any of it meant. They did the same thing. They translated half of them. And unfortunately, they also decided, we'll just add some more information too. And so they started to say, you know what, this kind of sounds like what David would have said when he was running from Saul. And then they'll add that into the psalm titles. Bad. Don't add. Don't add. Don't take away from God's word. Anyway, so that's my, does that answer question? Okay. uh, 
Do you have a mic yet? You should, uh, we need a mic up <clears throat> here for Mike. All right. And Daniel? Yes, Jonah. In Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 3, um, your Salah apparently was in the middle of the verse, but mine is at the end. Can you clarify for that? Your, yours is at the end of the verse? Yep. Mm-hmm. What translation do you have? ESV. Uh, I have God came from Teman. This is Habakkuk 3.3. 3. God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Selah. Mine, mine is, uh, and the earth was full of his praise. Selah. I think you might be in a different chapter. Uh, I, I, it's Habakkuk 3, verse 3. What do you have? Oh, where's his splendor covered the heavens? You let, maybe you left that out. His splendor covers the heavens? Covered the heavens? Mm. And the earth was full of his praise? Mm-hmm. So you have all the same words, your salahs at the end, though. Mm-hmm. They, they, they changed it. Uh, what, this is one of the weaknesses of the ESV. They update it regularly. So there might be three, four different versions of ESV in, our, in, in the auditorium right now. Uh, th- so they, my guess is, I have, not, I have not looked at why they did that. But my guess would be some texts that we have have it in the middle of the verse and some have it at the end. And for one reason or another, they changed their mind about where they wanted to put it. So there's, we, have, we have one text that has it in the middle and one at the end. There's debate about it, and they changed their mind, I guess. Thanks. There are other instances of Selah in the middle of a verse. There are instances of that. I gave them to you in your notes. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but it's in the notes there on Selah. For anyone who's curious, it's the 2007 edition that he has. And so mine's if yours... 2011. Yes. So they changed their mind and went, they put it in the middle of the verse. Maybe they, I don't know. I don't know why. They do that a lot though. So it's like a Windows update. Good news is as of 2016, I believe, they said, we're done. We're only going to make updates when it is essential. Up until that point, they were regularly making updates to improve it to clarify it, to correct maybe their own mistakes, and, and now they're done with that. So maybe we can buy pew Bibles now. Not worry <laughs> about them all being wrong. Okay. I have to get trained on how to use the mic. Uh, you Just compliment you guys. You do a good job with your podcast. Uh, good windshield time, redeeming things. So always appreciate the discussion. And you guys just bringing out this idea about the musical footnote at the end. Yeah. I mean, it, it looks like it's uh, Exodus 15. It's not as precise, but it's kind of like, you know, Moses said this and then Miriam. Yes. There's explaining, I think, that's kind of that prototype yep. before the Psalms are developed. So, yeah. Thanks for good work. Yeah. You're, you're welcome. Thank you for the encouragement. Uh, psalm 15 is one example of a, of a psalm. Uh, it's a song in the narrative. Now, in a narrative, you don't necessarily have to have a title because you can narrate the background. And that's what we're told uh, Miriam's song is with tambourines, right? So, and dancing. It's biblical. I'm just saying. Just throwing that out. No. Uh, whatever they were doing is not what you see today. Uh, they're dancing with tambourines. Um, that's like we're ex- instead of having a title, if we were to put that in the Psalms, it might say a song with, and then at the end, it might be to the choir master on the, with the tambourines, something like that. But in the narrative, it's going to shift just a little because you don't, yeah, you don't need a title when it's a uh, part of a, of a whole story. Okay. Now, did you kick Marion out? I thought Marion had a question. All right. Maybe they were feeling convicted over song titles <laughs> I was just going to add uh, curiously I have an ESV as well mine is 2001 ah. uh, so the Selah is in the middle 
Okay. So they moved it to the end by 2007 and back to the middle by 2017. Yeah, and last week Jason pointed out when I read 2 Timothy 3 that the man of God may be adequate, comp- I think it was competent instead of complete. And he's like, mine had a totally different word there. And then the online version had theirs. Apparently, mine was the updated one. Mine was the most recent. We couldn't tell. Apparently, their online version is not as old as the 2011 or something. I don't know. I, 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 anyway, that's an unfortunate mistake on the ESV's part. It's just, I don't know why. It's always bad when you change your mind twice. <laughs> that was a little embarrassing. Okay. All right. I need a mic here. Okay. Okay. Hold on. I, I was actually, <laughs> I was actually going to give you an excuse to get out of here. <laughs> uh, your answer was tradition. And is the original scripture out of date? Is Hebrew, Aramaic, no longer spoken and used? Is there still a living tradition of the Psalms with the music? I do not believe that there is a living tradition of the Psalms with the music. Now, there, there are tradition, traditions of the Psalms with music, but not the music. So it, I do not believe, I don't, I've never heard someone argue, although I would, I would probably... I want to talk to more some Orthodox Jews, you know, to, they would be the ones who explain this. But I've never heard somebody say, I think we know the song, the lyrics, or I'm sorry, the melody that David sang this to. I've never heard someone claim that. There, there, are, um, there, there were ancient ways of co- co- communicating notes. They did that. I, I left that article in your box. Did you see that? So we have at least one tablet that actually gives us, literally, it gives us the melody of the song. It's not Hebrew. It's, it's the Hurrian one I mentioned last, last week. It's, and it's all in Sanskrit. It's, you know, but it's there. Here are the notes. Here's how to tune it, and here are the notes. And then they give you the words that go along with it. I don't think we have anything like that in the Bible. Yeah. So uh, what was your question? Uh, I don't think I answered it. I talked about something you said, and I don't think I answered if, if it. If you're saying that everything is based on tradition, do we have a tradition oh. to base it on? Oh, no. Okay, my, when I said tradition, I was saying I think ESV is doing that because of tr- that's what everyone else before them has done, not because they have such strong evidence for it. When you're uncertain, what do you do? Well, I think it's smart if you're uncertain to go with what has come before. Don't change it just to change it. You need a reason to change it. So I don't think they're dumb for doing that. I just think we have a really good reason to change it from what it's been for millennia or centuries. You asked another question on that. Oh, is scripture out of date? There's no, no scripture is not out of date. Uh, Scripture is always up to date. Dates may be wrong. The scripture is not. So it's not that it's out of date. It's that we've deviated or gone away from it. Uh, We sometimes do, like I said earlier, obscure what was in the text. But this text is always what God has given us. And it's it's what we put our trust in. We know that what he spoke to us is true. God's word is true. I don't know that that's what you were asking, but that's my best attempt at answering it. Okay, Simeon. Oh, Amy. Uh, so in the notes, you had us um, write down styles, occasions, and choirs, and you listed five of them. And I, um, two questions. One, are those the only five that you see? Uh, I guess I ask because I was surprised that there wasn't one uh, in specific reference to deliverance from sin, because you mentioned deliverance from enemies spe- specifically. Um, I mean, I don't know all the Psalms by heart, but I feel like there's got to be one about deliverance from sin. No, don't, <clears throat> don't, you don't want to view these titles or colophons as exhaustive. They're not intended to give us every possible use or occasion. They are 
merely to say, in these cases, understand this is the background. So it's a positive. When you see this, understand it. That doesn't mean that nothing else is covered or nothing else is dealt with. In some sense, all the Psalms are prayers for deliverance from sin. These are specifically prayers when your enemies are surrounding you and you feel like you're about to be invaded and killed, which is half the Old Testament. So, I mean, it it, it fits. And we feel that too. Sometimes what you want deliverance from is your boss, your coworker, um, your, your kids or your spouse or your exams. Can I get an amen? Anyone in college, you remember that prayer for deliverance? Amen. <clears throat> so deliver, <laughs> deliverance, uh, in those cases, we're talking about temporal. That doesn't mean you don't need forgiveness of your sins. It just means the psalm is about, Lord, please deliver me from the Babylonians who have mighty war, uh, warriors and mighty mach- war machines, and they're coming to kill us. Please save us. Okay. We're we're just out of time, and I don't see any hands. You are welcome to stay after and ask further questions, but let me close this in a word of prayer, and I'll dismiss you. Lord, we thank you for the Psalms. We thank you for the, the ways in which we see our own hearts reflected in them, and we thank you for the instruction that you give to us through these Psalms. We pray that you would help us as we read them to pay careful attention to all of the words, to seek to understand what they mean and how they're used. And I pray that as we do that, we would better understand what's being said, that we'd understand uh, more of the flavor and the feel uh, of these psalms. And then by doing that, we would comprehend them better and that our hearts would be more inclined to yield to follow and to to obey what we hear in them. And we just ask that you would give us that knowledge and understanding as we study your word and the heart uh, to seek after it. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. You are dismissed.